Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as I tuned in to listen to the Senate debate on the Cannabis Act C45, I was given a stark reminder of why so many Canadians have so little confidence in that unelected, unaccountable body. Certainly, it is legitimately questionable if an institution capable of producing such baseless fear-mongering and ignorance has any legitimacy blocking legislation passed by an overwhelming majority in this democratically elected House of Commons. Disturbingly, in the hours leading up to the final vote on Bill C-45, the government, the Liberal government, was forced to quietly swear in two new senators to ensure its passage, even though they were not present for one minute of testimony, not one minute of debate, not one minute of review of the bill, yet they cast their vote lockstep with the government. Some democracy, some sober second thought, Madam Speaker. Now, after studying this legislation for over six months, it's not even clear that all 93 senators actually understood the most basic facts on cannabis, such as the most basic facts about cannabis quantity. While reviewing the act, Senator Nicole Eaton, a conservative from Ontario, said this, quote, five grams is about four tokes. So in other words, if I'm a high school student, I'm 16, I've got four tokes in my pocket, which is under five grams. So you just don't take it away from me, but I'm allowed to possess it, right? I'm allowed to have less than five grams or I'm allowed to have zero grams. This is what I quite don't understand, end quote. Oh, there's quite a bit the Senator doesn't understand, Madam Speaker. For the record, five grams of cannabis is enough for some 10 joints. That's far more than four tokes. Now, given this statement, I was rather surprised to learn that both Senators Eaton and Senator Linda Frum were forced to abstain from votes on the Cannabis Act because they stand to profit from legalization. Senator Eaton declared a conflict of interest over the bill, quote, due to an impending investment in the cannabis industry, end quote. However, until she recused herself, Senator Eaton was an active participant in debates, in debates and committee work on legalization, including voting against Bill C-45 at second reading. For her part, Senator Frum has a property that will be leased, quote, for the purpose of selling recreational cannabis. After initially indicating her opposition to C-45, she then recused herself from debate, deliberation, and voting on the matter. Now, while it may seem like a contradiction to publicly oppose Bill C-45 while privately investing in cannabis, such behaviour has become disturbingly common in this lead-up to legalization. An emerging group of so-called cannabis capitalists, notably composed of the same police officers and government officials who've spent their years prosecuting the war on drugs, has already begun staking its claim to the new recreational market. Some prominent names include Kim Derry, who served as a deputy chief when the current Liberal member for Scarborough Southwest, the Liberals' point man on cannabis, was Toronto Police Chief. He's now the security advisor for THC Meds Ontario. Former Ontario Liberal Deputy Premier George Smitherman, who once served as the province's health minister, is tied to THC Meds Ontario as well. Former Liberal Prime Minister John Turner is a board member for Mule Boom Organic Inc. Chuck Rafici founded Tweed Cannabis Inc., the country's first licensed provider to go public, while he was chief financial officer of the Liberal Party of Canada. And former police chief and conservative cabinet minister Julian Fantino, who once compared cannabis to murder and voted in favour of harsh, mandatory minimum sentences for cannabis as a member of the Harper cabinet, has now gotten into the cannabis business himself with former RCMP Deputy Commissioner Raf Sukar. Madam Speaker, it's a travesty of justice and hypocrisy of the highest order that those who fought hardest for legalization may benefit the least from it, while those who've spent a lifetime enforcing prohibition are now lining up to fill the boardrooms of the cannabis industry. Hear, hear. Now, those who put their liberty on the line as activists for legalization, who often, to, uh, in the pursuit of their defense of cannabis, 
took legal liability, got criminal records, not for any violent activity, but in their, in their drive to get sensible cannabis policy in this country, who now carry the burden of a criminal record for this efforts, have not only been shut out, but the federal government hasn't even offered them a path to participate in the cannabis industry or to obtain pardons. Shame. Are they now supposed to sit back in admiration of the moral flexibility and business acumen of their former detractors? The inescapable truth is that Bill C-45 is principally about legalizing the cannabis industry, not the plant or its usage. This bill is not about legalization, it's about making cannabis less illegal. If this legislation were truly about legalizing the cannabis plant, it would have heralded the end of criminalization, the end of stigmatization, and the end of the prohibitionist approach to cannabis policy that has been such a failure over the last almost 100 years. Instead, this legislation creates an incredibly complex criminal framework that legal experts and police chiefs predict will result in more, not less, cannabis offenses post, quote, legalization. Now, there have been many opportunities to change course as Bill C-45 worked its way through Parliament. And I want to be clear that I do give the government credit for rejecting the most harmful amendments proposed by the Senate and for accepting the NDP's proposals in a number of ways, including to legalize the sale of edibles and concentrates, albeit not for one year post-legalization. Uh, that's unjustified, but that's the best the Liberals would do. And to remove the misguided 100-centimeter plant height limit. Unfortunately, however, the Liberals have also rejected a number of key improvements to Bill C-45. Now, I'd like to take a moment to focus on some of the Senate's key proposed amendments and the government's response to them. First is home growing. Based on the advice of the Task Force on Cannabis Legalization and Regulation, the federal government has proposed to allow the personal cultivation of cannabis for non-medical purposes with a limit of four plants per household. But after considering a proposal to ban home growing outright, the Senate chose to amend C-45 to allow provincial governments to ban home growing themselves. Now, this isn't a rational or evidence-based approach to cannabis policy. As the College of Family Physicians of Canada put it, quote, banning home growing for personal use defeats the purpose of legalization, which is to reduce the harms of criminalization, end quote. Now, New Democrats believe that under legalization, the personal production of cannabis should be permitted similar to home production of alcohol, such as beer and wine. Personal production will play an essential role in eliminating the illicit cannabis market since it ensures that individuals who want to consume cannabis can afford it and have access to it in regions without nearby retail storefronts. Now, for many Canadians, particularly those in rural areas who won't be served well by uh, the retail um, marketing of cannabis, this may be the only way that they're able to get access to cannabis. And I would point out under the Supreme Court of Canada's ruling, medical cannabis users are allowed to grow their own cannabis. In some cases, they're growing eight plants and they can obtain a license from another person and grow for them. Wouldn't it be the height of folly if across Canada, one house on a block can grow cannabis because they're growing it for medical reasons, but the house beside them can't because it's for recreational purposes? That is the height of inequity and would make a mockery of the law, Madam Speaker. Now, um, <coughs> Madam Speaker, the health and safety issues generally associated with home cultivation, I would point out, are overwhelmingly the result of the large-scale industrial illicit growing operations that operate covertly in residential buildings due to prohibition. <laughs> this can result in damage due to improper ventilation and illegal electrical hookups pose a fire risk. However, the personal cultivation of four plants will obviously not pose similar risks any more than growing four plants of any other uh, species in the home. I would dare say that most Canadians in an average household have more than four plants in their house. Thus, by contributing to the dismantling of the illicit market, home cultivation actually serves to help eliminate those covert industrial growing operations. Furthermore, I want to point out that raw cannabis plants are non-psychoactive. According to University of British Columbia botany professor Jonathan Page, who testified at committee, 
if uh, anybody were to eat, including a child, the raw bud of cannabis, they would get the acidic form, which is non-psychoactive. The fresh material is not capable of getting you high. You need to bake it or heat it or smoke it in order to obtain that result. Now, the government chose to reject this amendment because they said it's, quote, critically important to permit personal cultivation in order to support the government's objective of displacing the illegal market. Canada's New Democrats agree. Now, on potency limits, the Senate also proposed an undefined potency limit for cannabis products. This is something I think the Conservatives are supporting. On this point, it's important to note that the Task Force on Cannabis Legalization and Regulation rejected potency limits for a number of reasons. First, they believe that if prohibited, these products would continue to be available on the illicit market. The task force also concluded that there is insufficient evidence even to identify what a, quote, safe potency limit would be. The task force emphasized the significant risks associated with the illicit production of high potency concentrates and instead called on the government to regulate them within a legal market. I would point out, Madam Speaker, that illicit producers often use flammable solvents such as butane to extract cannabinoids from plants, an inherently dangerous process that can also leave carcinogenic residues on the end product. Product safety was also a concern as the extraction process may also concentrate contaminants such as heavy metals and other impurities in addition to THC. So the government rejected this amendment because, quote, the government has already committed to establishing THC limits and regulations which will provide flexibility to make future adjustments based on evidence and product innovation, end quote. So while we support the decision to reject this amendment, Canada's New Democrats believe that the government should heed the advice of the task force in this area. Now, in branding, the Senate proposed deleting a provision of Bill C-45 that currently allows a person to promote cannabis, a cannabis accessory, or a service related to cannabis by displaying a brand element on a thing provided it is not associated with young persons, appealing to young persons, or associated with a way of life that includes glamour, recreation, excitement, vitality, risk, or daring. Now, the government rejected the Senate's amendment because, quote, the Cannabis Act already includes comprehensive restrictions on promotions, end quote. Again, Canada's New Democrats agree. Um, branding restrictions on cannabis in C45 are there now, Indeed, they are already more stringent than those applied to alcohol. I don't need to remind any of the members of this House of the tragedy that occurred just a few months ago of a young Quebec girl who died after consuming a high alcohol, high volume drink um, and ended up drowning in a river. And if you look at that product, it's definitely marketed to young people, it's definitely marketed even to children, and there are no similar uh, restrictions on alcohol. That's something that I think this House should look at closing in the future. Now, in terms of parental sharing in the home, just as is currently the case with alcohol, the Senate proposed to allow parents to share cannabis with a younger family member of at least 17 years of age in the home. Now, Canada's New Democrats believe that this was a sensible proposal and that the government was ill-advised to reject this amendment. We currently allow this approach for alcohol because we understand that parents can be trusted to model responsible behaviour to their children and to make positive choices for their families' well-being. In fact, New Democrats believe that parental education will be a key component of low-risk use of cannabis and should not be criminalized. So just as after this bill becomes law, parents will be able to legally consume cannabis in the House. And if they wanted to uh, pass a joint to their 17-year-old uh, and discuss responsible use of cannabis, th this bill would make that a, uh, a crime. Uh, we don't think that's sensible. Now, the government also rejected the Senate's parallel proposal to ensure that sharing among individuals close in age within two years would not be criminalized, and that a cannabis offence carrying a sentence of less than six months would not be used in deportation proceedings for someone without citizenship status. Now, uh, the government justified their rejection by saying the criminal penalties and the immigration consequences aim to prevent young people from accessing cannabis and to deter criminal activity by imposing serious criminal penalties for prohibited activities. Madam Speaker, if criminalization and the threat of imprisonment or deportation prevented people from using cannabis, then Canadians wouldn't be consuming an estimated 655 metric tons of it per year 
and we wouldn't have the second highest rate of cannabis use among youth between 16 and 24 in the world. And that's when we have full criminalization and life sentences for trafficking. Now, con contrasting that, Madam Speaker, a single bottle of liquor is enough to kill a child. And yet I know of no 14-year prison sentence arising from distribution of beer or liquor. But a parent who shares a joint with their daughter or son who's 17 is a criminal under this legislation. An adult who possesses 31 grams of cannabis in public is a criminal. A youth who possesses more than 5 grams of cannabis is a criminal. An 18-year-old who passes a joint to their 17-year-old friend is a criminal. An adult who grows 5 cannabis plants is a criminal. Now, this kind of continued criminalization is inconsistent with a rational and evidence-based criminal justice policy and will only serve to reduce the positive impacts of the bill. Indeed, Madam Speaker, the prohibitionist approach has been repeatedly discredited by its failures throughout history. Now, for far too long, we've wasted billions of dollars in resources in the criminal justice system by criminalizing otherwise law-abiding citizens at an alarming rate for simply possessing and consuming cannabis. In fact, we are today. According to Statistics Canada, in 2016, the most recent year of available data, there were about 55,000 offences related to cannabis reported to police, and police charged 17,733 people with pot possession. A recent Vice News investigation found that black and Indigenous men and women have been overrepresented in cannabis possession arrests across Canada just in the years since the Liberals formed government. And yet, Bill C-45 preserves the criminalized approach to cannabis, along with the damaging paternalism of the war on drugs. Now, I want to be clear that, from the very beginning, Canada's New Democrats have worked hard to reach across the aisle with constructive proposals to improve this bill. These changes included the following. Providing pardons to Canadians saddled with a criminal record for offences that will no longer be offences under C-45. This amendment was ruled outside the scope of Bill C-45, but given the Prime Minister's previous statements, it's shocking that the Liberal government would structure a so-called cannabis legalization bill in such a way that pardons cannot be included through amendment. We proposed empowering provincial governments to create parallel production licensing regimes in order to give provinces the flexibility to implement legalization in the manner best suited to their jurisdiction. For example, this would have allowed provinces to let craft growers, small-scale producers and outdoor growers compete against the federally licensed corporate giants. As said earlier, we proposed the legalization of edibles and concentrates, which is among the safest way to consume cannabis, which is the growing part of the market and which we know um, would allow Canadians and the, the entrepreneurs and businesses across this country to provide safe, regulated products to customers instead of allowing this to be provided underground. We propose decriminalizing the penalties section in line with the Tobacco Act. We propose that this legalization should take a regulatory approach with significant fines for offences rather than criminal ones. One of the purposes of Bill C-45, as laid out in Section 7, is to, quote, reduce the burden on the criminal justice system in relation to cannabis. We think penalties in the bill should be consistent with that stated intent. Now, I'm disappointed that the government chose to reject these vital proposals, but I'm heartened that this bill at least contains a mandatory review of C-45's operation in the next parliament. I view this as a tacit admission by the government that they know that this bill contains problematic sections that will need to be fixed. Madam Speaker, to be clear, Canada's New Democrats will support this motion and this legislation because we have fought for an end to prohibition ever since the 1971 Ladane Commission. The bill before us today is an important step forward, but it is far from perfect. Now, after the last election, Canadians rightfully expected that the Liberals would produce a timely and fair cannabis law. But as it now stands, the federal government has left the heavy lifting of legalization to the provincial, territorial, municipal and Indigenous governments. This bill will lead to the emergence of a patchwork approach to legalization that will shut out the most long-standing cannabis activists, the folks who spent decades honing the craft and providing world-leading medicinal cannabis to patients across Canada. Some provinces have chosen to impose a government retail monopoly, some have chosen to shut out existing compassion clubs, and some provinces are pushing to ban homegrown growing up outright. This is disappointing. It is a lost opportunity. It is a betrayal of the clear promise that the Liberals made to Canadians in 2015. 
Madam Speaker, done properly, an appropriate legal approach to cannabis can achieve impressive benefits economically, technologically, and medicinally. And New Democrats will continue to work to provide the best cannabis legislation that we can in the world for Canadians. Here, Thank here. you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I thank, I thank the member for, for, for his remarks, but you know, when he began his remarks by making some, quite frankly, very disparaging remarks and named a number of individuals um, that, and suggesting somehow uh, that they, they had done something improper, I just wanted to advise the member, because I know the member well, and, and I know he would never knowingly disparage an innocent Canadian, and, and I know he believes, as I do, that parliamentary privilege is not a license to, to slander innocent Canadians. And, and I just wanted to advise him that of the, the five people he mentioned as having some kind of privileged access to the cannabis business through Health Canada, that, that four of those individuals were denied their, in their license application and were not successful and are no longer in any way associated to the licensed cannabis industry. And the one who actually was, was approved by the previous government when the Conservatives were in power. And, and, and so I just wanted to give, through you, Madam Speaker, I wanted to give the member opposite an opportunity to apologize to those individuals who he unjustly disparaged. The RO member for Vancouver, oh, Kingsway. Well, Madam Speaker, I, I think the question uh, reveals a sensitivity um, that is, 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 is far in excess of, of what I actually said. I'm not going to apologize this House for pointing out hypocrisy. When a former Conservative a Cabinet Minister compared cannabis to murder and was part of the police process to actively prosecute Canadians for cannabis and now is rushing to, to profit from that industry. When former Prime Minister John Turner, who as Prime Minister of this country, could have brought in cannabis legalization or decriminalization if he wanted to and chose instead to perpetuate a criminal approach to cannabis and is now seeking to profit from it. It's that kind of hypocrisy that I think can, it's rightful to point out and that Canadians deserve to know. At the same time, all those Canadians who have been working under this prohibitionist criminal uh, regime, who have fought and put their, their liberty at, at risk, who have um, sometimes achieve criminal records, now under this legislation may not even be able to participate in the legalized market. I find that hypocritical. I find that unjust. Here, here. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable member, member for Selkirk Interlake Eastman. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. And I have to say that um, you know, I find it very disturbing to, uh, listening to the debate in here and the breakneck speed that the Liberals and the NDP want to have this law come into place and how our police agencies, including the RCMP, are not set up to handle how to deal with impaired driving. For those individuals in rural areas, uh, like my riding to Selkirk Air Lake Eastman, when they are actually now going to go out there, no, Madam Speaker, I'm trying to make a point here, and the member just keeps well, on. Yeah. I just want to remind members if they have anything to contribute, then they should uh, stand up and, and attempt to be recognized. The Honourable Member for Selkirk Air Lake Eastman. The member needs to be very aware that, that there is going to be now a process to determine the level of impairment. Right now, if you're caught with any type of uh, narcotic in your system, it's a legal activity. But now we're going to have to determine whether or not that individual is driving under the influence of marijuana. And of course, we only have so much resources in rural areas. In my riding of Selkirk Inner Lake Eastman, which is uh, about the same size as, of the state of Israel, what we're looking at is maybe one or two officers in the entire region that will have the ability to make that determination on whether or not somebody's impaired. And if that individual is on leave, if that individual is taking time off or is not a shift, how are we ever going to charge anyone and uh, that's going to give free license to everybody to be out there driving under the influence of marijuana? The yeah, member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Well, thank you. I, I think I, I speak for every member of this House, when, and we can join issue with the fact that uh, nobody countenances or endorses any Canadian uh, operating any kind of machinery, whether a motor vehicle or anything, or coming to work under the influence of, of cannabis. We all agree with that. But I would also point out uh, it's against the law now. It, it, you cannot operate a motor vehicle under the influence of cannabis now. Uh, and, and Canadians should be well aware of that. We have impaired driving laws in this country. The current law that's before the Senate, Bill C-46, uh, is an attempt to modernize that law with a specific focus 
on cannabis. And uh, th there are certain problems with that bill too, by the way, which is it seems to be quite difficult right now to get an accurate reading of impairment um, from uh, or to set an appropriate per se blood limit uh, uh, reading for, for cannabis. So there's some problems with that. But at the moment, we all know that uh, uh, driving under the influence of cannabis is against the law and it should be treated that way. Um, what I do want to talk about is whether we're ready or not. You know, I think very many times Canadians are ahead of politicians. And I'll tell you, I think the vast majority of Canadians um, who have voted with their actions for years now, millions of Canadians uh, have used cannabis and continue to use cannabis, and they don't feel that they're criminals in doing so. This law is an attempt, I think, to catch up to the reality in Canada. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Yellowhead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, last year I uh, stayed in Ottawa on July 1st for Canada Day celebrations. And uh, it was kind of a disappointing day because it rained really bad. And then I found a lot of the music had nothing to do with Canada's heritage or history. But anyways, we'll leave that aside. But what I did notice last year, being here in Canada Day, was that Wellington was pretty well plugged with people trying to wait to get in here. Thousands and thousands of people trying to get through security to get onto uh, Ottawa main grounds up here. And I wonder if through you, uh, Madam Speaker, if the member uh, could just put his imagination out there and just imagine all of them having a little bit of smoke or a little toke or whatever you want to call it. You know we have rib fest that's coming next week. And you know how this town smells so great with rib fest? Imagine what Wellington would s smell like with uh, 10,000 people smoking marijuana. I wonder if you can imagine that. It's running out of time, so I'll allow the uh, member for Vancouver Kingsway to respond. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm, I'm going to end by asking the honourable member to use his imagination as well, and that's focus on a piece of this bill that I think uh, uh, is another problem with it, and that is this bill prevents the exportation of recreational cannabis products. You know, the amount of money and the ability for Canada to become a world leader in cannabis and cannabis products as countries around the world start to legalize, and they are and they will, as California has done, as Colorado has done, as Washington State has done, as uh, many other states in, in the Union have done, and many jurisdictions across this the world have done, the ability to support our entrepreneurs who can develop safe, healthy, uh, high quality products for the world is something that we should be supporting, I think, in this House. And imagine Canada being a world leader in a new product that is uh, regarded around the world as being of the highest quality and safe. That's the kind of policy we should be working to develop in this House of Commons.